title of our message is Bethlehem and its Good News. Strange Christmas text, but I take you to John chapter 1, where we started this month. And he came to his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, he gave to them authority to become the children of God, to those who believe on his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor of the will of men, but were born of God. And the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Of course, you know from that, this is a description of Jesus Christ. We began our month by speaking of his eternal beginning. And these words that we speak of him, the word of God, it is speaking of his eternal nature, of his eternal. Yes, he was born as a baby. But when he was born as a baby, he was fully God and fully man at that particular moment. And we must understand that you must know that. If Jesus Christ in that manger is not God, then he is nobody. And we would not be celebrating it all these thousands of years later because he would have been as any other child. How many millions and millions of children have been born whose birthdays we do not celebrate? We celebrate this child because this child is God who came and we must remember when we celebrate Christmas, we must keep Good Friday in mind. Because he was born that he might have blood. A body thou hast prepared me, Father. A body so that he might go to the cross and pay for our sins. Our sins are what brought him to Bethlehem. Bethlehem. We remind ourselves, first of all, nothing special about this city. In fact, you couldn't call it a city at all. You couldn't even call it a town. It might be classified as a village. Uh, and that's about as much as you're going to get out of Bethlehem. There was nothing great about it. Outside of the fact that Micah spoke about it in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, that it would be the city where the Christ child would be born. It was notable because its greatest ancestor, of course, would have been David, who was born in Bethlehem. But at once David passed from the scene, Bethlehem never grew. It never became a city. It never became well known. It was always just that little watering place that people would stop on their way. It's about six miles north of Jerusalem. So on your journey to Jerusalem, you may have passed through it. But it's still to this day very small. In fact, when the children of Israel came back from their captivity in Babylon and they took a census and began to number the cities. They numbered over a thousand cities in Judea and not once did they ever mention Bethlehem. It was that, and I hate to say it, it was that insignificant. Oh, little town, no oh, little village of Bethlehem. Known mostly for its shepherds, and that's about it. This little town was but a shepherd village it had a great purpose, however, in God's design. God chose that Bethlehem would be the birthplace of his son. Hundreds of years before Christ would ever be born, it was announced that this would be the city. You have to wonder how many mothers had children born in Bethlehem hoping that theirs would be that one, that their child would be that child that would grow up and lead the nation that theirs would be the child who would redeem. Theirs would be the child who would sit on the throne of God. After all, we gave birth in this town of Bethlehem. But none of their children were called. In fact, none of their children would become known. But there was a great purpose that God has. And all God's purposes eventually come to us. And his purpose of redemption came in the form of this child. And it came into that very house that he had spoken about, the house of David, in that very same city, the city of Bethlehem. This city, which is so lowly, 
not even mentioned among the thousands of Judah. What a perfect place, though, for the Savior. The Savior who would come into this world with nothing. The one who would set everything aside, leave all of his glory, leave all of heaven, and be born in that lowly manger. We see the lowly Christ because we see him in this lowly city, this lowly town, this lowly village. It's a good place for one who would bear our sins. He who was rich, but for your sakes became poor. He who was rich could have been born in a palace if God had designed it that way. If God had said, my son shall be born in the palace of Jerusalem and all the world shall be his dominion at that time. Oh, it will be. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord someday. Someday that's going to happen. Just as someday this child will be born in Bethlehem and people for hundreds of years talked about it, maybe even began to give up on it. Maybe they began to think that the prophet was wrong. But then that night came when the angels opened heaven and told those shepherds, now you skedaddle and get down there and see that little child. You find him with his mama. He's wrapped in swaddling clothes. That's how you're going to know it's him. And they went and they came. And we have all these songs, as Michael had mentioned, that celebrate that night. The promise was made. The promise was kept. Jesus Christ, our Savior, was born in Bethlehem. All about this city seems to suit him. After all, this Bethlehem means the house of bread. And what is it that Jesus called himself? I am the bread of life, he would say to you and to me. So how fitting that the bread should come from the house of bread. Where else would you expect to find bread? Where else would you expect it to be made? Where else do you think it would ex expect it to be brought into the world? How fitting then that the bread of life was born in the city of bread, the house of bread. It is also called Bethlehem Ephrata, and Ephrata means fruitful. Not that the city was fruitful, because the city never grew more than just a couple of hundred, maybe a couple of thousand at its biggest I think even today it has less than 10,000 people in Bethlehem. Never became a metropolis. But yet it's called fruitful. Why? Because it gave birth to that one who was fruitful. Pointing to the fruitful one himself, Jesus Christ, who would bring to us the ability to be called the sons of God, who would lay down his life, that you and I could be saved, that we could be redeemed, that we too could become the children of God, not by flesh, not by blood, but through the Holy Spirit, by confessing our sins, asking Christ to save us. After all, what is it that the angel promised? For unto you a Savior is born. Savior. At the cross, we could see Jesus Christ becoming our Savior, but really he became our Savior in Bethlehem when he was born. He was born and destined to go to the cross for you and for me, because that's our weight, that's our sin. See, Jesus Christ promised to live for you and me a perfect life, die a perfect death, so he could redeem us to his perfect father, so that we could go to heaven. We can't get there now. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. And all those millions of people, or hundreds of people, thousands of people, I suppose you could say, who had been born in Bethlehem, were all sinners. And therefore, none of them could save us until Jesus Christ, God's son, came in the flesh so the Son of Man, the Word, became flesh and tabernacled with us. Bethlehem wasn't mentioned in our text by John, but when you read he became flesh, right away your mind is taken back to Bethlehem and that picture that we have of him. At Bethlehem, our history began. Stop and consider everything before Bethlehem, B.C., everything after Bethlehem, A.D. That's just how we count history. So our history, particularly those of us who are Christians, and the history of the Christian religion really begins in Bethlehem, where it's born, where it's given life. And so I remind you of these words one more time then. And the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God himself 
entered into. See, that word Emmanuel, that name Emmanuel, means God with us. And how truthful that is that God himself enters into that child in Bethlehem's manger. God, when Mary, you know that song they just sang, Mary, did you know? How could she possibly understand everything? I mean, yes, the angel told her that holy thing that is in you is going to be called the Son of God. But the comprehension of all that he would be and all that he is and all that he had become must have been staggering for her to imagine. She couldn't imagine what he was going to do in his life as the song lets out. Could she picture him healing the blind and giving sight to the blind and healing the lame and restoring those limbs and all that he would do? The ability to calm and to even walk on water. Could she possibly have seen and known those things? Could she imagine that her child could do all that? That he one day who is from the house of bread, who is the bread of life, could feed 5,000 on a hillside. And then 4,000, maybe nine days later. Could she see that? I doubt it. And so this Christ, Emmanuel, let's take two points then. First of all, what is it about this Bethlehem? It is Christ. The only reason we know of Bethlehem is because of Jesus Christ, period. David, well, when you read the Old Testament, you study the life of David, it mentions there, when you first meet David, you meet him in Bethlehem. But that's not why you and I remember it. You and I know David from his royal palace there in Jerusalem. We know Bethlehem because of Christ, the Savior. We know Bethlehem because of Emmanuel, God with us. And where did God join us? Where did God meet us? Where did God and man look face to face for the first time? It must have been strange for his mother, his father, those shepherds, those wise men, to actually look into the very face of God and to know that God was looking back. Jesus See, that's our Lord's name in time. But the word and the name Son are expressive of his eternal standing. He has always been the Son of God. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, these three are one. These three are the eternal God. And so when we call him the Son, we speak of his eternity. But when we talk about Jesus, we talk about someone who has a beginning that's his body. That's his bodily form. That's the name we knew him as he walked upon this earth. Christ, the Savior, spoke of, even at his birth, speaks of his death. He cannot become the Savior until he goes to the cross. It is on the cross that he becomes the Savior. As his blood is poured out, he is saving us from our sin. By the washing of regeneration, by his blood, he washed away our sins. What can wash away my sins, the song says? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And so that child was given to us that the man might go to the cross who, and when nailed there would say, Father, forgive them. Not just those men who were nailing him to the cross, but you and I who were causing his pain. It was for me and for you that those nails were driven deep into his flesh. Because we are sinners. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous. And that's God's word. There is none righteous. No, not one. The inaccessible God suddenly became approachable. That incomprehensible God, suddenly we could comprehend him. What God thought and what he knew and what he wanted all the nations of the earth, God has made one blood. And that one blood, the word, was made partaker, has the same blood that we have. When they stabbed him, did he not bleed? And was his blood not the same as every man's blood? Because he had that in common with us. By the shedding of his blood, he could redeem you and I who are of the same blood. Humanity's blood spilt on that cross. God has no blood. A body thou hast prepared me, Father. Why? Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. He had to shed his blood to redeem us. 
It had to be the blood of mankind. The blood of sheep and goats could do no good. No one was ever saved by the blood of the Old Testament. All it ever did was move their sin forward one more year. It was called the Passover. And they passed over it for one more year and one more year and one more year. Must have been a great heap of sin that was on the shoulders of Jesus Christ to have all the world's sins moved forward year after year after year until finally he would come and pay the price for all that sin. And not only the, all the sin before, but all the sin future, our sin, who weren't even born yet, who hadn't even committed the atrocities that we would. World War II was not yet spilled. World War I was not yet spilled. And yet all that blood of all the inhumanity that man has shown to men, he was paying for it on that cross. Suddenly, Bethlehem became a link between heaven and earth. God and men must meet and look each other face to face. And so those angels could look down upon men and say, for unto you this day is great news, good news, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. We ask ourselves then, what does all this teach us? It teaches us God's thoughts on peace. When we say peace, the angel said that peace, goodwill toward men. He didn't mean that men would have goodwill toward each other. That would be a hope. That might be a prayer. But even today, our world is at war in many locations, in many places. People are still hurting one another. There is death all around. There were just shootings not long ago. I'm sure even today, tonight, last night, men on Christmas Eve were killing one another. There is no peace, but yet that's what God said. And he meant peace between him and man. The peace of God, that's what he was speaking about. My peace, I'm no longer against you. The word peace in the Bible means cessation of againstness. I'm no longer against you. Jesus Christ has torn down that middle wall between us. And Jesus Christ, by the washing of his own blood, took away my sin and your sin. And now God has access to me and I have access to God. Just as they looked at that baby in the manger, I could look God face to face because my sin has been removed. My sin has been washed away. And so in order for Bethlehem to be all that it is meant to be, you must look at Bethlehem in context to Calvary. You must look beyond the cradle and see the cross if Bethlehem is to have its full wonder. Would you learn the ways of God? Then go to Bethlehem. The infant in the manger is the way. What is it that Jesus said? I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father but by me. How could we get to the Father if he never came? How could we get to the Father if that child had never arrived? And so we behold that child in the manger, knowing that that child would go to the cross, that Jesus Christ would make the way. I am the way. The cross is the way that leads home. The blood of the cross, which washes away our sins, is the only way. And that baby in the manger spoke of that. Would you learn then the vanity of this life in this world? Go to the manger where the Lord of glory lies. In that simple place, in that simple home, in that borrowed room where you and I would not want to spend the night, the highest became the lowest that he might redeem each and every one of us. Would you have the safeguard against worldliness and sin? Then keep Christ as your companion as we walk with him. And how often does he in the Gospels invite us to walk with him, to share with him? We sing that song, <clears throat> I Come to the Garden Alone. Beautiful song. How much time you spend with Jesus Christ, you're never robbing him of his time with another. His time with you is precious. Jesus Christ wants to spend time with you. You would learn of him. Learn of me, he would say. Learn of me. And so if we would be humble, then we must go to Bethlehem where the highest became the lowest. What could be more humble? God himself laying down upon all of his royalty and all of his regal splendor to take upon himself this 
simple form, this most powerful, the creator himself, suddenly is looked upon as a little baby, just a child, weak and simple. Will we learn of self-denial? Then we must see the word become flesh, who laid aside everything, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but for our sakes became poor, and laid aside all of that, all of that majesty, all of the worship of the angels. He laid all that aside, the comforts of heaven. He laid that aside for the rough life that he would live on this earth. The denial, the betrayals, the death, the agony and the pain, the thorns that he once created would be placed upon his own brow. The tree that he made would become his hanging place. And the metals that he had placed into the earth would become the head of that spear that would pierce his side. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word became flesh because we have no hope apart from Jesus Christ. If God doesn't redeem, if God doesn't save, then there is no savior. Man cannot save. Remember when John is in heaven and he is given that scroll and he begins to weep because no one in heaven or under heaven was found worthy of opening that scroll until finally the Lamb of God, the one who bled and died on the cross, came forth and took the scroll out of the Father's hand, the one who had redeemed us, the one who had saved us, the word that had become flesh and dwelt among us. He is the Savior. If you're here today and you, you were to ask yourself this question, if you died today, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? Or would you doubt it? There's one way to know sure. Jesus Christ promised that whosoever believeth in me should not perish but have everlasting life. We all know that verse. For God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that God gave his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's what Bethlehem's all about, John 3, 16. That God gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16 closes with a great warning, though. Whosoever has the Son has life, and whosoever has not the Son does not have life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So I would encourage you today to receive Christ as your Savior. I'd invite you to pray a simple prayer. Father, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, I invite you into my heart to be my Lord and Savior. Take me to heaven when I die. Amen. A simple prayer. What a powerful prayer, though. It takes us from this world and transports us at the point of death into heaven itself. That's why he came. And the word became flesh, that he might die for you and for me.